Barbara Bush has died at the age of 92, and Andrew Oak has been with us many times before to talk about various first ladies. In this case, we're going to focus on the first lady who was first lady for President George H.W. Bush and the mom for President George W. Bush, POTUS number 43. He's the author of The First Ladies Man, author of Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, uh, as well as Volume 1 and 2, and is tweeting at... Uh, First Ladies AO also has an Instagram at First Ladies Man. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks for being here. Tim, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, even even under these circumstances. And and I think we, we can temper our sadness in some ways with some joy, if if it's appropriate, because of the fact, number one, she did a leave a long life. 92 is a pretty good amount of time on this earth. And she led what, by most accounts, would be a pretty full life and, and a happy life. And I think she said... I've I've enjoyed my life. What was your experience when you were putting together your book and 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 looking at the life of Barbara Bush? Well, Tim, you're exactly right. I mean, she was prepared to to go and she said that. She made statements and she said that that she she didn't fear for herself or her family because of the work that they've done and married 73 years, 92 years old. We should all be so lucky. This was a woman who could straddle the fences of personal and professional like no other I've seen. She led one of the most productive post-White House lives of any first lady in history. She was the matriarch of uh, one of our most successful political dynasties in America. This is a truly remarkable woman who did all of this with such grace and such humble, quiet effectiveness that she was embraced by all. If you can live this long and be in the public eye this long and have no one around to say a bad thing about you, you're, you're, it's unheard of. You're, you're doing the impossible. And that was Barbara Bush. She did the impossible and led a remarkable life, and her legacy will, will outlast all of us. She did have some critics, some of whom she said I ignored, like the press. One of the things that strikes me about her, Andrew, and of course you and I have talked about the First Ladies, but the, the, the idea that there were a lot of Americans who identified with her as either a mom or a grandmother. And, and it's, I think that's one of the things that it's sometimes difficult to imagine a First Lady being your mom or your grandmother. But in the case of Barbara Bush, that was somebody that they, they sort of thought of in that way. You're absolutely right. And and one of the ways I got to know her and one of the ways I write significantly about in her chapter was the fact not only did she say, spend time with your family, spend time with your loved ones, because no matter how many awards you win or how many speeches you give or, or titles you have, those won't matter in the end. It's the time and the quality spent with your loved ones. She lived this. She walked that walk and talked that talk, and people could sense that. It was palpable. She was genuine. She was been scrapbooking since she and H.W. started dating in the 40s. There are thousands of pictures in thousands of pages of piles and piles of scrapbooks in the archives in College Station at the Bush Library and Museum, and they show a family that we think we know so well, but we show, it shows them to be that mother and that grandmother that we all thought she was. This was real stuff. There's pictures of them around the Thanksgiving uh, table, around at Christmas, wearing ugly sweaters and making faces behind each other's uh, backs and, and teaching kids to ride bicycles and birthday parties and fishing trips. I mean, all of these women are human, but to get to know a woman in this human way and look, I mean, just think, go through your own family photo albums. What do we see? We see real people doing real things. And she lived this in her personal and professional life. And people embrace that. And that's why everyone is talking so wonderfully and positively about her now. Uh, Again, we're talking to Andrew Oak, author of Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies, and we are speaking specifically today of Barbara Bush, who has passed away at the age of 92. I I was looking at the lead in the Washington Post story from Lois Romano, who notes that uh, Barbara Bush, whose embrace of her image as America's warm-hearted grandmother, belied her influence and mettle. Can you give us examples of her influence and metal that might be, if not contrary to, but a a different part of a more complex personality than just the warm-hearted grandmother? Oh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, they called her the Enforcer. That was her nickname given to her by her son, George W. Bush. And she was a, 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 a vicious supporter of, of her family. I mean, she did not take any guff from anyone. She said what she meant, and she meant what she said. Her granddaughter, Barbara, even said that she got a scolding after she was uh, uh, unusually boastful after a tennis match or something like that. She kept everyone in check. I saw recent interviews with the whole family there where they were talking about wonderful moments together, and everyone's getting sappy and crying around the table, and Barbara Bush is cracking jokes and telling everyone to to, to, to 
pull it together. And, and, and she, she, she did not put up with, with any nonsense. And, and she was very vocal about it. And again, I mean, when, when she was criticized, I think someone, someone wrote that she wasn't a terribly attractive woman. And she was asked about that. And Barbara Bush's answer was, I'm a fine looking woman. I just don't dress very well. She had a self-deprecating <laughs> sense of humor. She knew her self-worth. She knew her family's worth. And even in the C-SPAN series that I produced, she was interviewed and she said that Jeb Bush had not uh, thrown his name in the ring yet for the presidency. But she said, I think people of America could find someone whose last name wasn't Bush or Clinton. I, she was not afraid to, to say. But then when Jeb Bush does decide to run, she's the first one to go to bat for him. I mean, of course, she's going to do that as a mother. But it's a hard enough to be a first lady in any capacity. But to be the wife of a president, the mother of a president, the mother of a governor and presidential candidate, and still to do it with the kind of grace and fortitude, you have to have metal to do that. I mean, sure, she's lovable. She's embraceable. Everyone wants to hug her. But man, if you hug her the wrong way or say something bad about her family, watch out. She'll come down with, with, with vengeance. Yeah, that was the uh, the key line or one of the big takeaways in the uh, in the campaign for Jeb Bush was that his mother was saying we've had enough Bushes as president. I wonder, Andrew, about seminal moments. For example, if you go back to the death of one of their children at the age of three years old, and what uh, when their their uh, daughter Robin died at, uh, of leukemia at the age of three. What did that? How did that influence her life? Well, this is a perfect example. Tragic, of course. She's, she's a young mother. Uh, I, I think Robin was the, the, the second or third born child, and to have any child die before you as a parent uh, is just is, is an unimaginable tragedy. But what the Bushes were told, these young parents were told, there's no hope for this child. There's no cure. Just take her home. Don't even make any kind of public announcement. Love her for the remaining days that you can and, and be done with it. That wasn't good enough for Barbara Bush. She did seek out treatment. They had the means to get the child to uh, a, a, a clinic in New York where they were doing some experimental treatment. But just never give up and try. And, and, and this is not, uh, unfortunately, uh, unique to the Bushes as far as losing children, especially in the 1700s and 1800s, of course. But many presidents and first ladies lost children at a very young age, many even in the White House. And the ones that used this to move forward and strengthen themselves are the ones that we remember in, in ways like we're remembering Barbara Bush. But I think that's key to her personality as well. She took everything in life, good, bad, and otherwise, and used it to her advantage to build a strong character and move forward with the good work that she did. I, the work that she did in Maine at the Barbara Bush Memorial uh, Medical Center uh, uh, is is, is another feather in her cap. Remarkable work with children, terminally ill children. I mean, and these are right up to very recently. She was attending uh, uh, book reading sessions there on her birthday, going to read to sick children in the hospital, taking time out of her day and away from her family that was so valuable to still give to others right up to the very end. I uh, and, and to the point about literacy, I was stunned to hear one report that she and George H.W. Bush had through their efforts uh, in the White House and afterwards raised over a billion dollars for literacy, $800,000 of which, by the way, came in after-tax proceeds from Millie's book, which was her pet dog. It was written through the eyes of her pet dog, which I think was the first experiment uh, in that kind of a piece of, uh, piece of literature. Uh, very much so. I mean, they, they raise 50-some million a, a year uh, with these literacy uh, uh, events and, and bookmobiles. And, and that's something that affects everyone. That's men, women, children. I mean, it's just, and she said that once we conquer that, I mean, the ability to read and write and learn is, is, the, is, is, is taking it one step further from after your health, you need to be productive and wanting to create and help people be productive in life and as Americans and as human beings was paramount in the Bush household and is seen by their efforts. I, I, that's why I say that, that you, you, at the beginning, you said, you know, this is a bit of a celebration. And it is because Laura Bush, or Barbara Bush, well, and now Laura Bush, all of them are living these lives that promote a legacy far beyond their existence on earth and create such a platform for this good work to continue that, that we will be remembering the Bushes for this philanthropic work long after we're gone.
You know, Andrew, there was uh, there, I've seen a lot of people quoted like neighbors and so on and said that she used to walk the neighborhood. Of course, now she, a little bit less. She was less mobile in her later years, but she used to walk the neighborhood. She was just like regular people. Uh, and, and, and in some ways, the way this is being arranged now afterwards, she will lie in state, lie in repose. That people will be able to come and see her and say goodbye. But then there will be a private uh, funeral. So that sort of sounds like in keeping with the idea of family. But but really, in this particular case, there's a certain private aspect to it that she wanted to keep just within the family. For sure. But there is that need for this public to mourn such a celebrated and beloved individual. And, and, and this makes me think of a point that all of the people that I know that currently work in the White House or worked in the White House previously, worked in the Bush administration, worked in multiple administrations. And that's the key. The people in the White House, Secret Service, pastry chefs, uh, stewards, butlers, they're not in there for one specific president and first lady, as you well know. They're in there for years and years and years. That's a career for them. They see people come and go. When I ask the people that I know who have been there for the longest, who do you miss the most? Who was your favorite? Hands down, it's always Barbara Bush. They are. She is their favorite first lady. All politics aside, they were satisfied to see her go because she was so nice. She remembered people's names. She remembered children's names, pets' names, knew when people were having a tough time, gave little gifts and care packages here and there, always nice around the holidays to people's families. Uh, uh, of people in the White House. And when someone who sees you on a regular basis, working day in and day out, they are sorry to see you go. That's, again, a life well lived, and that will be sub- celebrated in public with the American people and, and, and appropriately so in private with such a tight family. And she liked the White House, I guess. She did. She liked the White House. She was very sorry to leave. She did not want her her husband to to, she wanted him to be a two term president. I don't think any wife wants their their husband to lose an election. But there are definitely first ladies that that didn't like being under the microscope and wanted to get out of there as fast as they could or, or didn't even want to be there in the beginning. But Barbara Bush led a life, a full life, the majority of her adult life in the public eye. And again, she knew how to separate personal and professional. So when she could do that and when she could ignore her critics and when she could focus on family, but all of the good professional things she was doing and had that true life balance, why wouldn't you want to stay there? I mean, she, she was she was getting great work done and, and having a very successful life with her husband that continued after the White House. Just, just a, a truly remarkable woman. I can't say enough nice things about her. Check out, if you want to see more about Barbara Bush, the chapter that Andrew Oak put into Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Lady. So sit down with Barbara Bush, now the late Barbara Bush. Andrew, I appreciate your jumping in this morning and joining us here on POTUS. Thanks so much. Always great to talk with you, Tim. Have a good day. Andrew Oak, the First Ladies Man, author of that book, as I mentioned. He has an Instagram account, at First Ladies Man. He also has a Twitter account, at 1, the numeral 1, S-T, as in First Ladies A-O.